Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. It's the last study this week. And um, study number 20 of looking at uh, <clears throat> Daniel's last vision. And so we have, we've covered a lot in this past week. We're going to do a little bit of a review and um, look at some things again in more detail. So before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Uh, dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for the time that we have here this morning and for the light that you are giving us. And we know, Lord, that uh, there are many distractions that try to draw us away from studying your word and from prayer. And we just pray, Lord, that um, those distractions, uh, that we, that your angels can be with us, that we can have a desire to do your will, and that you can forgive us for our sins. We need you in our lives. And so we just ask that you be here now as we open your word together. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay. Well, uh, good morning, everyone, again. So yesterday in our study, we had, um, uh, we looked at this plot. So the, the plot in, in the book of Esther in, at the end of chapter 2. And we, we could see that, that, that there was a connection there in some ways um, with, with the history of Trump. So, because that's in the history of Xerxes. And we, we haven't dealt with all of the symbols there because we asked some questions uh, regarding uh, different things. And we're going to go back and look at that again. Uh, then we also had a discussion um, uh, later on in the study because I look, tried to look at it openly, open-mindedly in the idea that, well, Xerxes is Trump, definitely in the first three chapters of Esther. But the question is, would we continue having Xerxes be Trump? You know, so back on December 25th, 2021, um, when Colin presented that, uh, Alexander the Great was Trump, right? That, that Trump still needed to continue. My, my point was it doesn't need to be Trump, right? That's the view that I took because I understood that not completely, but I understood that there was something about the lines that we were missing because we had examined the foundation. We had looked at Millerite history. And we had looked at mistakes that they had made. And um, uh, because I understood that we, we were in a some kind of zoomed in line and that we knew, well, December 25th, 2021 wasn't definitely the Sunday law. March 27th, 2021, nothing of import happened. July 18, 2020, our prediction had failed. And even November 9th, 2019, anything that we thought external that was going to happen didn't. It was only something internal. So I knew that we are on some kind of internal line. And the things that we were experiencing were typical of something that's going to come later. But I didn't understand enough to say, well, I know you're wrong. Let me explain why, right? Not that you're supposed to do that, I guess. But I, I didn't know enough. And so the criticism was, well, you said that Colin's wrong. And, um, but I wasn't really saying Colin was wrong because we still need to examine and understand what it was that he was shown. Because I believe he was shown something. And that, that when he looked at Daniel chapter three, the Sunday law, and he saw this connection to these first few verses of Daniel 11, and he, was making an application to the riddle in Revelation 17, that there was something there that we need to examine. And we really haven't examined it yet. We've started on the path to examine it. And the way that we are examining it is we're looking at everything. We're trying to understand Daniel chapter 3. And one of the ways that we, we do that is we know there's a parallel between the first three chapters of Daniel and the first three chapters of Esther. And we know that in the story of Esther, we have the story of Xerxes, and we know that, that Xerxes typifies Trump. 
And so we're trying to understand that. Now, one of the things that, that, we, that we presented, and I thought rather effectively uh, yesterday, is that when we look at Daniel 11, chapter 3, and it talks about a king that will do according to his will, we know that when we look at Daniel chapter 11, verse 36, we have this same expression. The king shall do according to his will. Now, we also have this simple fact that um, uh, we have a king that shall do according to his will. And we have um, a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. So in, in historically in uh, the mistake that was made. So we know Uriah Smith when he comments on this. And so we should we should actually look at what he says. Um, so this is Daniel and Revelation. Um, so he says here, and the king shall do according to his will. So he's going to quote this verse. And then he says, a king magnifies himself above every god. So he says, the king here introduced cannot denote the same power that was last noticed, namely the papal power, for the specifications will not hold if applied to that power. So he makes an argument that the description here does not describe the papacy, which we know he's wrong. We know he's wrong because of um, uh, Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and other things that Ellen White refers to. So she she clearly marks that this is the papal power. Um, now, I can't remember if it's here. So normally he says, I know that someplace he says, if it said a, a king instead of the king. Um, but maybe it's not in this description here. Um, I don't see it here, but I know he says it somewhere in this commentary, but I don't see it in this here. Um, but anyway, he's going to apply this to France. And so we know the mistake that he makes here is, and I don't know why it's not here. You think it would just be on this verse. Um, let me see. I don't know why they don't put it here. But anyway, we had in, in verse 31, we have the transition from the daily pagan paganism, the desolating power of paganism, and the setting up of the abomination that maketh desolate. Right? So the arm standing on his part, that's Clovis, right? And and so it's going and, and he's going to agree that this is all the papacy, right? But then when it says the king shall do according to his will, he's going to say, well, a king magnifies himself above every god. But we know it's not a king. It's the king. The, and I can show you this here in the Hebrew. It's going to say um, right here, Hamelech. So that H at the beginning, that ha doesn't look like an H and R, but it's a ha sound. And then this is Melech. So it means the king, right? So it's not talking about some a king. If it said a king, it would be introducing a new power. But he's arguing that even though it says the king, it's still uh, introducing a new power, which doesn't make sense. So the king means it's a definite king. And that definite king is the king that we've been talking about, this power, this papal power, but also shall do according to his will. Um, so this expression here, and I was going to do a, a search on it, but um, uh, this word, ratzbon, so do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself. And I know if you look up this expression, um, 
I mean, God can do according to his will as well. But uh, the, the expression here, uh, I guess I want to look for the exact expression. This way. Um, so he did his according to his will and became great. Now, we know here in 8 verse 4 uh, that this is referring to uh, 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 Persia, right? So the ram pushing westward and northward, he's going to do according to his will as well. So it doesn't mean it's always referring to the papacy. Um, but we do have it in 11.3. And 11:36, and um, there are similar expressions in other places. Uh, so, so a person could argue in Daniel chapter 11, verse 3, that just because he's doing according to his will, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't connect us to Daniel 11, verse 36. You could just say, well, Persia does according to its will, right? So. So I'm just, you know, being fair here and looking at this expression. Now, we do know that um, if we look at the characteristics of the papacy, um, and that all of these, the characteristics of the papacy, uh, what does it mean that it does according to its will? Why, why does it have that characteristic? So when we look at Daniel chapter 7, you have these different beasts, right? So you have the lion, the bear, the leopard, right? And they have different characteristics that, uh, um, you know, because the lion has a mouth speaking great things. Uh, the bear has ribs in its mouth and uh, one shoulder is higher than the other. And then Greece, it's going to have... Um, uh, these four heads and four wings, right? And then you're going to have this fourth beast that's diverse from all of the others. Now, now when we say it's diverse, um, that word, uh, it, it's, it's a Chaldean word, it's Aramaic, uh, but it means to alter or change. So it's not just that it's different. What is the characteristic of Rome? Just the, the main characteristic about Rome. If we think about Rome, what is its its primary characteristic? Beyond its strength, Rome is also the only one that would continue to accept all of the other false deities of the lands that they would conquer. Okay, so they're synchronistic, uh, or what's not the word synchronistic? Um, well, in a sense, there's another word, uh, syncretistic. That's the word I'm thinking of. Syncretism is that they adopt characteristics of the nations that they conquer. Would that, that be what you're, you're talking about? Yes. Okay, right. So that's what this diverse means. They, they're, they're adaptable and changeable to the circumstances. And, and they, they take on the characteristics of the nations that they conquer. An example of this, which which I got from reading, it was a, a Catholic priest who became a, a Seventh-day Adventist. But he, he had been a Catholic priest in different countries in the world. And he had noticed that, you know, if he was in India, they would adopt Indian customs and incorporate them into the Catholic worship. When he was in Mexico, they would do the same thing, right? So the, the idea of the Catholic Church, and we see this when the Catholic Church conquers uh you know, Rome and they take over 
the pantheon, right? They just take these pagan gods and give them new Christian names, right? So that's that's a characteristic of Rome, both pagan and papal. So this fourth beast, of course, is Rome. It's not just papal Rome, it's pagan Rome, but that's a characteristic of pagan and papal Rome that's different from, from the others. Now, what about the idea of doing according to his will? What, what characteristic is that? Where does it come from? What is, what is it referring to? Would this be a reference? Oh, self- Sorry, Dwight. That's the self-exaltation of Satan. And I okay. know when I was on the dark side, that's what I wanted. I declared I wanted all knowledge and all power. That is demon possession. Thank God for deliverance. Okay. Well, I think it's something very specific, actually. So, Dwight, uh, go on. You well, know. I would look at this as their dogma of papal infallibility. Okay, so if we look at the characteristic in Daniel 8, verse 4, which we had already read, it's going to be Persia that does according to his will. Now, what is the character, the primary characteristic of Persia? Meta Persia here in this case. That their laws are not to change. Okay. It's a constitutional republic, right? I would have to agree to that, yes. So could we say that this idea, this phrase, he does according to his will, has to do with um, the laws that are made by this power, Rome? Because remember, he seeks to change times and laws, right? Which which is a characteristic, of course, that Media Persia wouldn't do, right? Because Media Persian, the laws of the Medes and the Persians cannot change. But that somehow here, he's going to change the laws, but still do according to his will, that he's, he's going to enforce his laws. And so when we look at pagan Rome, so pagan Rome, um, it adopts the characteristics of, of Babylon. What's the characteristic of Babylon that pagan Rome has? Is it not even in supremacy? Right. So the idea of, of having been this universal kingdom, right, conquering everyone, that's a characteristic of Babylon, correct? Right. The characteristic from Medo Persia, as we, we discussed, has to do with this legal system. Right? So so Rome is going to to have that characteristic as well. This order, this government, this um, system of law and, and, and order that, that comes from Persia. And that's how Persia became great. If you look at Persia and you look at how it expanded its empire, it expanded it through uh, the building of roads and infrastructure and, and through uh, the bureaucracy that it developed. That's why it can have 127 provinces. Um, you know, with all these different princes over them, these different governments, but yet working together as uh, a single uh, nation, so to speak, right? Even though it's Medes and Persians. But still, this, this is uh, a kingdom that develops um, through the order of law and, and law in the sense of, of order, like civil law, structure, the whole infrastructure of, of a nation so that Trade can happen, and it can happen safely. Then the characteristic from Greece, what's the main characteristic from Greece? It's educational system. Right. So, so Greece has, one is it's, it's philosophy and art and education, right? So, um, and I mean, we know that Alexander has this characteristic in that he's, and Greece has this, right? That he has four wings, right? 
four heads because it's going to divide into four. But, um, you know, it's, it, it expands rapidly, the, the Greek empire under Alexander. But that's not the main characteristic of Greece, right? You know, just we would say it has to do with its philosophy, its education, its learning. And, and to some degree, um, the form of government, right? So when we look at um, a democracy, that's something that really originates in Greece. Okay, so, so I'm just saying that this characteristic of doing according to his will, I think is a characteristic that comes from Persia, but it becomes utilized or distorted um, by Rome. Now, I um, don't know how to get into this next topic here. Okay, so, okay, so when we we deal with, uh, so we'll just kind of finish off this thought. So when we deal with this characteristic of a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will, we can see that that this is Greece, right? So Persia does according to its will, but Greece also, right? So we had it with Persia in chapter 8. We have it with Greece here in chapter 11. But then we're also going to have the papacy have that characteristic in verse 36, right? So the king shall do according to his will. And we know that's not France, right? Even though that that's what Uriah Smith and the pioneers believed. They believed that this was talking about France. And that's just because... Uh, he magnifies himself above every god. But we know, if we compare this with Second Thessalonians, uh, we can see that this characteristic is the characteristic of the power. So Second Th Thessalonians chapter 2, um, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, that's in verse 4, or that is worshipped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. You're not going to argue that this is France. Now, back in uh, 2012, um, we had a Sabbath school quarterly on the book of Thessalonians. And there was a section, I think it was in November. Uh, so I think it was like October, November, December quarterly. So the fourth quarter, I believe, of 2012. And um, I used to go to Collins Bible Studies. Uh, on Saturday nights when he was in Edmonton. And um, so I was in Warburg Church that Sabbath. Um, I don't remember if I was the one teaching the lesson or not. I don't remember that. I, I, I remember studying the lesson, whether I was the teacher that week or not, I don't know. But anyway, the discussion came up about this because what the quarterly was trying to say is that um, in Second Thessalonians, um, that uh, where it talks about um, how did they put it? So they compared this to their to Daniel chapter eight, and and they tried to argue that um, uh, especially when you get to verse seven, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work; only he who now hindereth will hinder until he be taken out of the way. Right, because they're going to argue that it's Christ's heavenly ministry that has to be taken out of the way. So they're not going to interpret this chapter in in the way that we do that this is the papacy. Right, even though you read any any Protestant commentary, they're going to say that this is talking about the papacy. Right, and so. Um, so the way that they the, and 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 the power that has to be taken away is pagan Rome, right? So in order to make way for the papacy, pagan Rome has to be taken out of the way. But what they're going to argue is the one that's taken out of the way is Christ, right? Because of their view on the daily, they 
they do something that nobody has ever done with Second Thessalonians chapter 2, is to make the one that's taken out of the way of, is Christ, not pagan Rome. Right. So he's going to be hindered until he be taken out of the way. And they say, well, the one who's taken out of the way is Christ. OK. So, I mean, they're still going to have it as the papacy, but they're 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 going to have pagan Rome not involved in this chapter anyway. Um, so uh, what was the reason I was doing this? So when we deal with. Ah, so when we deal with uh, Daniel. Uh, because we're looking at these characteristics, we know that this is the papacy and we can see the same characteristics in Daniel. Uh, who wrote the Sabbath school quarterly then? I have no idea, Angela. Um, doesn't really matter. Uh, somebody wrote it. <clears throat> uh, so anyway, when you uh, uh, look at Daniel, here it is here, Daniel chapter 11, I know Ellen White quotes this and she connects this to the papacy, this chapter here. We can see that this is the power that's talked about in Second Thessalonians. This is the man of sin. So to argue that this somehow is now referring to France, even though it has all of the characteristics that we apply to the papacy, makes no sense. But that's what the pioneers did, right? That's what Uriah Smith did. And, and they just, well, he didn't regard any God, you know. But we also, you know, nor the desire of women, right? nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. This is the papacy. This definitely is not France. And, and then in, in his estate, he shall honor the God of fortresses or forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold, silver, precious stones, and pleasant things. They shall do, thus shall they do in the most strongholds with the strange God whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many, and shall divide the land for gain, right? And at that time, at the time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him. So the way the pioneers look at this is they said, well, this is France, and Egypt's going to come against France, and then the king of the north shall come against them like a whirlwind. Well, that's, that's Turkey, right? So it's going to come, you know, against France. So that's the pioneer view. But you can see the problem. And it's the same problem, I believe, that we have in, in trying to say in chapter 11, verse 3, when we have this king that does according to his will, he shall stand up, shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. But even though this is historically, so historically, we know that this is Alexander the Great, right? So Colin would agree with me on that. This is Alexander the Great. But when we're making an application, we're taking something and we're putting it into our time. We need to recognize that we can't just have Persia, which is the United States, and, and the historically what's Greece. We can't just have them move from one to the other and say, these, these are both referring to the United States. So we know that the next thing that comes is the Sunday law, right? So, so we have that here in the story of Xerxes. And, and so that's what we have to examine. So in Esther, you know, we looked at one and two, and we got to finish off looking at this. Um, but then when we get to three, this is the Sunday law. But this has to be occurring under uh, Daniel chapter 3, or Daniel chapter 11, verse 2, under Xerxes, not under Alexander the Great. So, but I know that we're not looking at everything, right? So at this point, it could seem a little bit scattered, but you'll see what I mean as we go through this. It's going to take us a bit of time, but that's what we really want to examine next week. We have to thoroughly finish off Esther. We have to understand these things. We need to be able to put them on a line. We need to be able to explain them, and we have to be consistent. But, but you, hopefully people can see, see the problem. 
that the king that does according to his will is a characteristic that Greece, in some ways, is inheriting from Persia. Um, but it's a characteristic that would have to that 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 we're going to see in the papacy. So that their laws stand. And, and so this is going to relate to the Sunday law. When we start looking at Revelation 12, 13, and 17, I think we will see this more clearly. So that there is this, there's always this transition from what we would call more literal to spiritual. Okay, so when we were looking at chapter 2, um, we spent time looking at this plot. So, so we're, we seem to be agreed. Maybe it's more tacit agreement on most people, but because they didn't really say anything. But when we look at this plot, um, we can say that this plot relates some way to July 18th, right? So the, the way we've took it, taken it is that, um, um, Mordecai, and we're saying that Mordecai represents this movement in some way. And then we have Esther. So what does Esther represent in this story? It would be a message, right? And this is a message that basically is, she's going to tell this to the king, what Mordecai has uncovered. And so we're relating this to some way in revealing what was supposed to happen at Nashville on July 18, 2020. And that we're taking uh, an assumption that that warning in some way delayed what was going to happen at Nashville. It's related to delaying it, right? So that means, um, and, and it could be, so we have this inquisition that was made of the matter. And how did we interpret Big Than and Teresh? Because Big Than is going to represent the wine press and Teresh is going to represent strictness. So how is this plot exposed? What do Big Than and Teresh represent? Taking God's word and, and, and uh, delving it. <laughs> but yeah, so we don't even know exactly what the plot was. And then I was thinking I was was trying to figure out whether Trump or was going going to be in Nashville at that time or whether he was sending envoys there. I mean, that thought just came to me for yeah, well, July 18th, 20th. Yeah, so in our application, we're not saying that the plot is to kill Trump. You know, that's not what we're saying. So we're not saying that, because in this story, the plot, there is a plot. So we're not saying that there's a direct correlation between the details of this plot and the plot here. We're just saying that the plot in our history is uh, the attack on Nashville that's uncovered through diligent Bible study, right? That is this strictness, this exactness in which we uh, came to understand July 18, 2020 and the symbols associated with it. Would it be? Yeah. Would it also be the method in which this study was conducted? Yeah, that's what I'm saying, the method in which it's studied. So it's in this wine press. Now, the wine press has two aspects to it, because obviously God's word, we have, you know, its doctrine is, is wine, and of course it has to be pressed. But there's also our experience, right, the experience of this movement. A wine press can, you know, Christ trods the wine press alone, right? Right. So that refers to affliction as well. And then this strictness. So this is this exactitude, this detail in which this is done. So that this is a thorough study of God's word. Now, so we're not saying the plot is to kill Trump, right? 
we're just saying that there's a parallel between this history and the idea of something that is uncovered, but later on, there is a reward going to be given to Mordecai for uncovering that plot, right? All right. And that's going to turn upon the enemies. That is the enemies of this truth, right? Um, instead of being exalted by what they're planning to do, right? Because they're planning the disgrace of God's people. It's actually going to be their own disgrace in the end, right? Because they want to be honored. But in the end, God's people at the end of the world, the 144,000 are honored, not the ones who wish to be honored. So, so it's not a direct correlation. We're not taking this story and saying, here, you know, this there was a plot to to kill Trump, right? That's not what we're saying. We're just saying that there there was something that we uncovered, and and so when we were discussing this, we were saying, well, you know, is Trump the one who's going to then, you know, honor us in some way? So there was this idea that well, here's something that happened in our history, and when Nashville is bombed in the future. Is there going to be a record or an acknowledgement that yes, these people who made this prediction that that failed, they were actually correct, right? There's there's the idea that that could be a possible way to interpret it, but I'm saying that it would be interpreted on a larger scale. That's true. July 18th and everything we predicted at some point, we will be vindicated over this. But it's not necessarily going to be in our, you know, immediate future. It's not like Nashville is going to be bombed next year and, you know, Trump will be president at the time. And then he's going to go back over the records and say, well, yeah, when I was president, you know, the Secret Service told me about this plot and they had actually uncovered it, you know, to bomb Nashville. And um, so, you know, we should somehow reward these people with this knowledge. Uh, that they that they gave. Uh, so I'm not taking it in that so literal and narrow a sense. I'm saying that that what happened in our prediction of July 18, 2020, in the end, in the ultimate end of things, is is going to be seen that it was something that was true. It was based upon God's word, even though the event didn't happen at the time predicted. Okay. So, so that's where we went into at that point when we started talking about that. Um, then we started looking at Daniel 11, verse 3, and Daniel 11, verse 36. And we're saying, well, there's, there's a change that happened. And that change wasn't recognized by the pioneers when they were making their application of Daniel 11, verse 40. Right? So they were still looking, the king of the north must be Turkey, the king of the south must be Egypt. This movement is founded on the idea that the characteristics of the king of the south, right, are not, they're not tied to a particular location in our time. That is, France is Egypt. Now, France does conquer Egypt in some ways. So you could say, well, there's some kind of conquering that goes on there. And Rome does conquer uh, Syria or Turkey, right, that area at, at some point. But it's not because they still retain that area that makes them the king of the south or the king of the north. So when we have the king of the north, um, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be the papacy. Well, the papacy doesn't have to, you know, be a nation that's in control of, of all that territory. I mean, obviously, the papacy, in a sense, kind of controls the world, at least the Catholic world, which is most of it. And then the King of the South, well, it's going to be France in 1798, but that's going to move to the Soviet Union. And so then we recognize what that characteristic is. It's this licentiousness and this atheism. And we know with, with Russia, Russia really admired the French. So if anybody's ever read Russian literature, like Dostoevsky and Tolstoy, I mean, people are always wanting to speak French, 
Um, it's just a cultured thing to do in Russia. And they considered Russian and French the two most beautiful languages. Uh, that was told to me by a Russian woman who came from Russia before the revolution. Um, and then uh, uh, the other thing is thy licentiousness. So if you look at at Russia um, and uh, how women were treated in that society, um, yeah, they were, I mean, every man had mistresses or whatever. It was just, it was part of their culture. And this is something they, they admired from the French as well. So that's sort of whatever you want to call it, free love or something, maybe in the 60s, the same idea, right? So, so these ideas, these are characteristics of Russia, but the Soviet Union inherits this atheism from France. And so the, the Russian Revolution is, is really wrought with the same power that, that brought about the French Revolution. It's going to be, you know, a century later or more, but it's still going to be based upon what happened in France. So the, the Soviets, you know, are atheistic, just like France was. So, so we can see how that, that passed on there. And then we have, of course, this belief, um, which, which we still haven't fully examined, but we're going to have to look at. And that belief had to do with the idea of coming up just to the neck. And so the idea was it was Moscow still was behind it. So, so even though the Soviet Union was destroyed, the head wasn't destroyed. But I argue, and we did in some of our other studies, that the head is, is not the city of Moscow or the leadership of Moscow. The head has to do with that even though the Soviet Union fell, globalism did not die. And so globalism still existed within the UN and, um, and in other forms. And now that globalism really has conquered the world or the United States. Um, and then of course, we know that that has to be reversed. Right. So there's a lot of details in those those statements. Those statements are making a very, very broad, uh, very broad brushstroke without much detail. But we're going to have to examine those details and show how that is. So, so when we get back to this story here, we say that this uncovering of this plot parallels something that has to do specifically with this movement. Now, remember, the first angel's message is Esther chapter 1. The second angel's message is Esther chapter 2. We are in the second angel's message in the context of the repeat of history. Right? Since 9-11, the second angel has arrived. Now, on Ellen White's line, she just sees the second angel arrive, the angel of Revelation 18, at the Sunday law. But we know we're in the history of the Sunday Law since 9-11. So we just see a lot more detail. And we know within the second angel, there is uh, this other history of the midnight and the midnight cry that are part of that second angel before the third angel arrives. And we take the position that in that bigger line that Jeff has of 9-11, midnight, midnight cry, Sunday Law, that we are we have not yet reached midnight in that line, that we're prior to midnight. We're in, in a sense, the prediction before midnight. Now the prediction before midnight is Samuel Snow's letters. So we're still in Samuel Snow's letters. So the history that this movement has experienced has been a typical history of something that's going to happen. And that's seen here in Esther chapter 2. Right? So so Esther chapter two is first going to be this woman who responds to the call, right? Because you have the first woman, that's, you know, if we're going to apply it to our history, that's the Seventh-day Adventist church. It rejects the call. And its judgment comes on the 10th day of the seventh month. Right? And then we have, since 9-11, this other woman who accepts this call. Now, this woman here, Esther, we're saying that Esther in this story is, 
is representing a message. It's representing the second angel's message in this story. And now Mordecai is representing this movement in this second angel's message. And this uncovering of the plot is what has developed within this movement in the July 18, 2020 prediction. And it's come about through Big Dan and Teresh, right, which is this diligent Bible study. Now, we also know that there's this inquisition made on the matter, right? Now, the word matter is that word to bar, right? So we've seen that in the book of Daniel. Um, so the inquisition being made on the matter, what is the matter in the book of Daniel specifically? As we talked about it, because we have the matter and the mara. So we have the debar and the mara. We have the matter or the thing and the vision. So what's the matter in that? Chazon. No, it's not the chazon. The matter, because remember it said, so when we looked at Daniel chapter 10, you might have missed that, Stephen. But it's going to say here, um, uh, yeah, he, he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. So the thing here, the Debar, we go back to chapter 9. And in chapter 9, um, he's going to say, uh, therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. So the matter is going to be the 70 weeks. So when you get to chapter 10, now he had understanding of the Marah, that's the 2300 days, and he has an understanding of the 70 weeks. Right, so that in Daniel chapter 10, he has an understanding of those things, which is another important thing to understand in the context of what we are studying. So, so the thing, the Debar, the matter, so we know in then in Esther, where it says um, uh, inquisition was made of the matter, we're going to say that in the context of this, that this is a studying of the 70 weeks. Are the 70 weeks connected to our understanding of July 18, 2020? Like not just in some, um, you know, indirect way, but in a very direct way. Yes. Yes. Okay. And, and of course, one of the studies that we had was the two Lamex, right? In examining the 70 weeks. Now, I know not everybody uh, knows the whole history of how these truths unfolded. I started writing a paper um, showing the things that I had a part in, in discovering and how one thing led to another. But the, the amazing thing to me is the things that we discovered that the significance of them all came together with July 18, 2020. So for instance, I had done this study on the two Lamex because in 2014, I was looking at all these patterns and these structures. That's where I discovered the 666 years with the two periods of 36 years. I've discovered the significance of the connection between the seven weeks and the one week, and also the significance of the 62 weeks that they're divided into 31, right? And the 70th week is divided by 31 AD. All these different studies dealing with that. But the two Lamex were this key, the 70 times seven and the 777. They were tied together in the 70 weeks. But we came to understand Lamech in connection with um, uh, 187 and also, um, uh, because how old is how old is his dad when he's born? If I got that right, I'm just stupid. Yeah, so when we look at Lamech, Okay, so I'm not looking at, yeah, here it is, right? So we're going to have uh, Methuselah, 
it says he's 187 years old and begets Lamech, right? So back then when I did the two study of uh, two studies on the study on the two Lamechs, I'm I'm not paying attention to the 187 years, right? Or to the fact that if we we take uh, Enoch 65 years and the 187 and you add them together, you get the 252 not looking at that at all. So I do this study on the two Lamechs, and all I'm interested about is the 77 seven years, because I can multiply uh, seven times seven times seven and add it to the 62 weeks and you get 777, so 343 and 434. So, so you can see that we, way back then, before we have July 18, 2020, we have a study on the two Lamechs, and then we have the simple fact but the name Lamech, if we take the gematria and multiply the letters, we get 18720. We, we just didn't know that back in 2015 when I do the study on the two Lamechs. Right? You, you understand what I'm saying? That, that how things unfold and these connections, they unfolded in a way that we couldn't even understand the significance of what God was showing us. Okay. So if we, and I'm getting a little bit off track here, but, but you kind of see the point, right? That we have this understanding in the book of Daniel regarding the matter. So in order for us to understand Daniel chapter 11, do we not need an understanding of the matter and the vision? Yeah, it's just 70 weeks in the 2300 days, right? And, and it's the study of those things that lead us to, to understand July 18, 2020, right? So when we look at uh, Esther and you know, chapter two, and we just we just take that phrase that this is an examination or an inquisition was made of the matter, that that has to be referring in the application we're making to an understanding of the 70 weeks. And then it says, therefore, they were both hanged on a tree. Now, he that hang, is hanged on a tree is the curse of God, right? This is a reference to Christ. In the 70 weeks, we have the crucifixion of Christ. Now, so this isn't talking about the judgment of Big Than and Teresh in our application as, as somebody bad, because we're saying that this is something good. It came about through this diligent study of God's word. But if they're hanged on a tree, doesn't this refer to the fact that we are, in a sense, hung on a tree, that we have to be converted. We have to be crucified with Christ. And, th and this refers to our experience uh, that God has been leading us to in the study of these things. But this is about a true conversion. Have I brought those things together that you can see them clearly or not? So we have had an experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I Angela? can see the parallel. Sorry, Theodore. I can see the parallel, but we can also say that in the eyes eyes of the world, the worst of the world we are cursed with christ right like they but, hate christ yeah but i don't know what that has to do with trump particularly no, i'm uh, not talking yes. about trump right now i'm talking about the spirit of the world in general i don't know if you can feel it but i can feel it heartening i've already dealt with some of those people yeah well, definitely we deal with hatred all the time. There's a lot of hatred uh, towards truth. Um, so, and, and, 
and manifesting Christ's character. There's a lot of hatred towards people who who try to reflect Christ's character. I mean, because that's because we know if we go back to Genesis chapter three, I mean, the seed of the woman and uh, the seed of Christ, right there in conflict with each other. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. When you reflect Christ's character, for some people that's very condemning. You know, just just even making a moral stand, whether it's in diet or dress, for some people can be very condemning. They just think that, that you're judging them because you do something different than them, right? Um, because they don't want to change. They hate anything that points to the fact that they're sinners, that there's something wrong with them. So, so yeah, so he that's hanging on a tree is the curse of God. We, we know though that, uh, you know, Christ died on the cross. He's the curse of God, but we also have a cross to bear. And we experience that in what has happened in this movement. So, so when we're making this application here, we're, we're taking this story and it's not a direct correlation. We're not interpreting it as a prophecy about what's going to happen. We're just taking this history and the symbols here and we're saying we can make a correlation with the symbols that are presented to July 18, 2020 prediction, right? Because that's what we were doing in the book of Judges. We're not taking a, a one for one correlation like we would in a prophecy. We're not saying this is a prophecy about what happened in our history. This is a history that parallels our history and the symbols here can can apply, but we don't just take the story. We don't say, you know, well, there's a plot against Artaxerxes or Ahasuerus, I mean, which is Xerxes. And that, that means there was a plot against Trump, right? That we uncovered or anything or somebody uncovered, right? It's not what we're saying. We're just saying that there's a parallel between this uncovering of the plot and our July 18, 2020 prediction that we can see in the symbols here. So when we go to chapter three and uh, and look at this um, uh, the Sunday law, so we 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 take this decree as what? So so we have to apply it as this third angel's message arriving. So we know the Sunday law is the next step. So we've experienced the first angel's message from 1989 to 9-11, Esther chapter one. But we also are applying that in a, in a more zoomed in sense, right? Because we're saying that's Trump, right? So we're applying that to our history. So we're applying it to the first angel's message, but not the first angel's message necessarily from 1989 to 9-11. We also are zooming into our line because Trump isn't there from 1989 to 9-11. Trump is there, you know, in 2016 and 17, right? He's, and, and onward. So, so if we do that, if we say, well, Trump is stirring up all against the realm of Grisha, that's what he's going to do um, in his tenure as president. And this second angel's message is, comes in his tenure as president. Where does this third angel come into? Because we still have Trump here. And, and my view that I've stated many times is that what happened with Trump is that Trump was deceived regarding the pandemic. And that this would refer to the things that Trump set up in the time that he was president, right? Because he's going to be the one who uh, uh, brings about this, uh, you know, the vaccine development. He's going to expedite that, right? So, so how do we then? So, how do we address this? Chapter 3. 
because we have Haman now. So who's Haman, right? How are we going to apply that? So we have to look at this history as it was fulfilled, and then we make an application to our history. But we're still going to have Xerxes representing Trump. Now, so we could say, well, this is Trump when he becomes president again, right? That was the, the suggestion, because this is going to talk about the Sunday law. But this isn't about the Sunday law here, is it? Chapter 3. I mean, it is, but it's about the decree that's going to bring about the death of the Jews if it, once it's an exact in, enacted. But this is just this is just about the issuing of the decree. So has something been set in place by Trump through the fact that he was deceived that in the end is going to be connected to the Sunday law? Does that does that make sense? Okay, first off, was Trump deceived? It seems so, by Fauci and Al. Yeah, so yeah, so Trump was deceived, right? Now he tried not to be, right? And he, he didn't act he didn't act as a tyrant, he didn't do all these lockdowns and all these mandates. These were done by the states for the most part. I mean there was the initial um, you know, uh, actions that the American government had taken. But Trump, mostly what he tried to do was to set up things to address all of these people that were going to be sick, right? So he gets, uh, you know, the military, uh, you know, like in New York, he gets the, the ship there that can be a hospital and all these different things. So he gets ready for what he thinks is going to come based upon uh, the information that he's given, but none of it happens. I mean, there isn't this massive amount of people who are getting COVID and needing ventilators and so forth, right? In fact, ventilators are probably not really very helpful. Um, you know, there's other treatments that could have been done. There's all kinds of things that were happening in that history. Um, Right. So I, I don't remember all the details of everything that either Trump did um, or so we know that uh, yeah, let me see here. I'm just trying to find. Uh, OK, so. So we know that uh, obviously we have some revisionist history going on because uh, were the Democrats concerned about the pandemic right right from the start? And uh, they try to make it like, you know, Trump just downplayed the pandemic. Did the Democrats downplay the debt pandemic? Yes. Yeah. And, and, they, and they did things in New York, like going to some Chinese New Year's celebrations or something like that, um, saying, you know, there's no risk, right? Of course, they forget all of that history, right? Trump was just downplaying the pandemic. You know, we took it seriously. But of course, they didn't. Um, uh, and so the actions that was Trump was taking, uh, taking like uh, placing restrictions on all chat travel from China on January 31st, that's going to be opposed by the Democrats, that Trump is overreacting, right? So um, so we, we have all this sort of history that if, if you look at it now, they're, they're going to spin it in a different way than it actually happened. But we were there, right? We saw what happened. So... Um, You know, so like if you look in Wikipedia, it says Trump repeatedly uttered falsehoods regarding the pandemic. Well, pretty much everybody did, right? And um, and of course, some of these falsehoods were stuff that was just simply told to Trump. 
It's not like he just made stuff up necessarily, right? So, so there was a lot of misinformation going around, all kinds of different things that were happening. So now when they rewrite this history, um, you know, like it says here in Wikipedia, Trump shied away from admitting mistakes in his handling of the outbreak, but instead blamed others. Well, did Trump make mistakes regarding handling the pandemic? Uh, yeah, and, you know, a lot of that just has to do with all the misinformation. I mean, who could have made, what would be the right thing to do? I mean, in retrospect, it's easy to sort of say, well, we should have done this and should have done that. But at the time, there was no sort of the right way and the wrong way to handle it. There's all kinds of voices giving all kinds of ways in which it, it, it could happen. The point that we're making here is that in Esther chapter 3, we have Haman. So Haman represents something. Now, the interesting thing about Haman, what's the Hebrew number for Haman? You can see it there. It's 2001. Is that significant? Always. Okay. Right. So Haman being 2001, he has something to do with 9-11. And 9-11 in what way? Would we, we would take um, the authority that happened from 9-11. We move from Roman law or from common law to Roman law, right? Guilty until proven innocent. Would we say, say that that's partly what Haman represents with the number 2001? That's an interesting premise. Yeah. So, so we have, so we can see what happened in 2001, the actions of the government in response to terrorism. We see a parallel in response to the pandemic. Okay. So we can take that pandemic and we can put November 9th, 2019 as the start of the pandemic. Right. That's 9-11. You understand what I'm saying? Now, you know, they used to have, I don't know if they still have it in Wikipedia, but when you, they would have patient, because uh, in it was in Odilio's study where they have uh, the first case, they have it as November 17th, 2019. We don't, we, we actually believe that the first case was earlier Right. So but they still have it on their Wikipedia page. Uh, but the first cases were when does anybody know when the first cases were? At least by in, in the beginning of October, they already know that there are cases, right? Correct maybe even in September, that the first cases, the first people infected at, at the Wuhan Institute. So, so they still keep the November 17th date there on Wikipedia. But Odilio, uh, in his study on the mandates, he, he addresses that. But we can still put the pandemic begins at that 9-11 way mark, right? November 9th, 2019. We can say, in that time, the pandemic has begun, right? And Jeff had put placed the pandemic between Rafi and Paneum, right? And, and so we had, it's obviously not the Rafi and Paneum on the big line, but in our application of it, 9-11 or 11-9-2019 is Rafi and July 18 is Paneum, right? And so in that history, we see this development of this pandemic, right? From November 2019 to July of 2020, we have this, this pandemic develop to become a worldwide pa pandemic, right? So it happened just like Jeff said, okay? So we have that. Um, 
that symbol. So, so Trump is in this history. We have Haman who represents 9-11, but we know 9-11 is 11-9, right? So Haman is representing the globalists, the UN, that is involved in what is happening. So the World Health Organization is connected to the UN, right? Right. It's um, how, how are they how are they connected? The World Health Organization and the, the UN. Like, why do we have a World Health Organization? Like, who, who, who put these guys in power? Elites. OK, right. So the World Health Organization is the directing and coordinating authority on international health within the United Nations system. The objective, the objective of the WHO is the attainment by, of, by all peoples of the highest possible level of health. That's uh, uh, from the UN itself. Okay, so, um, but yeah, we didn't we didn't ask to have the UN decide for us what to do, right? So this is. This is the elites. This is the globalists, right? So the World Health Organization and the UN, these are the globalists. And um, so we can see that that Haman being symbolized by this number, this Hebrew number 2001, um, is obviously uh, not a coincidence. And it shows the, the, now you say it's the elites, the word Haman means magnificent, right? Um, which would relate to the idea of the elites. Okay. Okay. So, so Haman represents this this globalist agenda. Can we agree with that? Hopefully we can. Now the name Hamadatha, so he's the son of Hamadatha, and that name means double. So what would be the significance of uh, a double? Would that be a repeat of history? Would that be 11-9 represented uh, by 9-11? Yeah. Was it, it would sh show, um, Anything else about the double? It's a Persian word, of course, so is Haman. But Hamadatha means a double. So he's uh, Haman, the son of a Hamadatha. And, and the H at the beginning has nothing to do with Haman. It's just um, means the double. So he's the double. So uh, so his father is the double. So obviously he's a double of something. But uh, um, Hamadatha, the Agagite. So the Agagite is um, the word Agagite is I will overtop. I'm not sure what that would mean. I will overtop. But that has a type of, I would take it as a type of exaltation. Okay, so we can see then that this, that this history, we can easily apply it to the pandemic, right? That's all I'm trying to say here at this point that we can apply to the time of the pandemic in which Trump is being deceived by Haman, right? 
So obviously, you know, we would say Fauci is part of that. But really, it's the globalists who are, are deceiving Trump. Now, remember, Mordecai is not giving any reverence to Haman. Now, Mordecai represents this movement in some way. Are, are we deceived by, by Haman? Are we deceived by the pandemic? and all these government, uh, the news media, everybody, right? We're not, right? Now it says, the king's servants which were in the king's gate said unto Mordecai, why transgressedest thou the king's commandment? Okay. So I don't understand that state. So Trump's megalomania would play well into the hands of other narcissists. Um, can you explain that, Angela? I don't understand that. I'm just saying that he's a very proud, very vain man. And if people would say, if you can profit by this, get in, in, into Operation Warp Speed and pretend to be the savior of the people. You know, he's always looking for praise and adulation. Okay, and that's his downfall. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so Trump obviously, and, and that's what's going to happen with Xerxes, right? Yeah. One is there is a supposed enemy that's going to destroy him. And, um, you know, so so we can see see the parallel that between Xerxes, you know, that you're going to receive. Uh, how does it how does he do this here when he tells him? Um, Yeah, so he talks about this nation that's going to destroy, you know, these people that's going to destroy your nation. Um, and so he's going, he's going to be deceived by Haman. Um, now, the thing is, you know, Haman is going to be doing this. Now, he's going to be casting these lots. Um, before he shows this to to Trump, right, to Xerxes. So there is a work that's being done behind the scenes that Xerxes is unaware of, right? And this is is basically it's this hatred that the globalists have uh, towards the truth because there are people who won't bow down to the globalists, the Jews, right? Now, specifically, we have Mordecai, which is this movement. But, I mean, there's lots of other Jews. I mean, they're not necessarily the problem. He's focusing upon this one guy. So he wants to destroy all the Jews because of one person, right? Because it doesn't say that no Jews reverenced Haman or bowed down to him. But he knows there's one guy who doesn't, and he is a Jew. And that's the one that he has to try to get. But instead of just getting Mordecai, he's, he's going to do this against the Jews. So the king's servants say to Mordecai, uh, so these are the ones in the king's gate where Mordecai would be, why transgressest thou the king's commandment? Right, so we can definitely see the parallel here. Um, so on a day-by-day -day basis, uh, he doesn't listen to them. 
and they're going to tell Haman about this. Um, uh, to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand. Now, again, that word matters is words, right? Debar, Debarim, would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. Now, so there's something here, and we could say that this, this history because we have Haman bit representing 2001. But this starts, so this starts long before. Um, so the name of Haman results, you're saying, to tumult and destruction, the meaning of Haman. How do you get that, Stephen? Well, um, Strong's um, so says, And well, that's 2001. So I think it's related. It's quite similar to the one 2000, which is that okay. primerate. It means to put in commotion, to disturb, drive, destroy, break, consume, crush, destroy, discomfort, trouble. Okay. Um, the, uh, that's what I get from the exhaustive dictionary of Bible names. Okay, so they're they're related. I mean, they're not they're not spelt the same, but because um, because one's Haman, um, and the other one's Haman, Haman, and the other one's Haman, right? So there's one ends with a mam, and the other one ends with a noon. So I don't I don't know if they're related, but. Um, uh, to me, they wouldn't look like related words. Where did you get the meaning meaning uh, mag magnificent? Well, that's from Brown Driver's Briggs. Right. So if you look at Brown Driver's Briggs, 2001, there. It's magnificent. Right. And this is a Persian word where if you look at um, 2000, this is actually a Hebrew word, not a Persian word. Okay, so the Bible dictionary names um, sort of mentions well disposed as one of the meanings, but also has like solitary. A rioter, the rager, their tumult. So mm -hmm. I'm just thinking maybe they're getting out from the Hebrew rather than the, the Persian. They, they might be getting it from the Hebrew, not the Persian. Yeah. So. So anyway, that that's what they have there for Haman, and and, and definitely I, I don't think it's related to the word Haman. Uh, because one is Hebrew, one's Persian, and they're not spelt the same. Okay. Yeah. But in, anyway, so um, so we know that we we can look at this history and we can see the parallels. I hope people can see the parallels between what we experienced with the pandemic and what's happening here. That there's this work that's going on behind the scenes. You know at least since 2001. Now we know that there's a lot of stuff that happens in that history uh, regarding, um, uh, you know, because of the what happened in 2001. Uh, we end up with this much more, I don't know what the word would be, cooperation, consolidation of all these different um, uh, organizations to to stop terror right so you have the Patriot Act they want to stop terrorism there's a lot of things that go on wars all kinds of deceptions we also have some um, um, outbreaks of different viruses right so we have uh, I can't remember the names of all of them um, 
but there are some of them are related to the coronavirus. And so we know prior to uh, the pandemic, there was all kinds of um, scenarios that they were examining about what to ha what would happen if there was a pandemic. And whether you believe the pandemic was planned or whether you believe it came about by accident, um, the thing is they were prior to that having these plans of how they were going to deal with the pandemic. And so they had a pandemic on their hands and they enacted their plans, right? Um, which are extremely destructive. Their ideas, their plans for handling a pandemic are just stupid. They're childish. They're um, ignorant. It, it makes no sense to, to handle a pandemic in the way that they did. Uh, with the masking mandates and, um, um, you know, and, and shutting shutting down the economy, um, the cure is going to be worse than the disease, right? So, you know, it's sort of short-term thinking, but it's also never made sense. Never in the history of pandemics did you ever. Uh, quarantine healthy people who aren't sick, right? You quarantine the sick or the, the vulnerable, uh, but you don't just take people who are healthy and, and quarantine them. Um, cause in the long run, people suffer. Um, so probably the damage done by the reaction to the pandemic were worse than the pandemic itself, right? So. I mean, something that could be debated, but definitely it wasn't, you know, the actions of, of Trump and all kinds of other people, they're all uh, bad actions. But Haman here in this story symbolizes actions that were in force before Trump is, or Xerxes is, um, aware so he doesn't know what's going on behind the scenes right but this this plan has been going on for a time now remember uh that this is a plot there was this plot with big them and teresh and there is a suggestion that haman might have been involved in that plot earlier correct Because this is going to be sometimes later. Eight, Esther chapter three is um, because the one is going to be in the uh, in the uh, sixth year, right? Seventh year. So the sixth to the seventh year that we're going to have this um, you know this time because he's going to have the the campaign against Greece in the sixth year of his reign. And then in the seventh year, that's when he's going to, uh, from the sixth to the seventh year, picking a wife. And then he's going to pick uh, Esther, right? Okay, so I don't know why. That's why we're on file. Okay, let me see here. So then it's going to be in the 12th year. So we're going to go basically five years later. So so we don't know for a fact that Haman was involved in that plot, right? But we we can assume that it's possible he was. 
Does that does that seem fair, or is that? I can't see it personally. You can or you can't? I cannot. Okay. So how did how did we say see that that Heyman might have been involved? There was what's the suggestion that we had that he might have been? When we studied Esther before, how how did we come to that conclusion? It was when we were studying the Apocrypha, right? Correct. Do you, do you remember, yeah. Dwight, what it was in the Apocrypha that gave us this implication? Yeah, Is I do. And I think what we'll do, what we should do is bring, is have this in detail on Sunday. Okay, so, so you can bring that up on Sunday? Yeah, we've got it ready. Okay, yeah, because there was a reason why. So our time is up, of course. So um, so we're going to look at that on Sunday. We'll look at why we think Haman was involved in that plot. So we don't see it in the King James. There isn't something here that we can point to, but there is something in the Apocrypha that implies that. Okay, so uh, thanks, everyone. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study here this morning. And um, even though we know it's a little bit scattered, all these threads we have to bring together, we just ask that as we continue through these studies, you'll help us to see how it all fits. And um, we pray, Lord, that you can be with those who are studying these things, that they prayerfully and carefully can consider the things in your word, especially the light that shines upon our sins and reveals to us our need of you. You know, Lord, we need a, a conviction and power in our lives, and the studying of your word uh, brings that about. And we ask for forgiveness for our sins and that your angels can watch over us in all that we do. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.